from the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Talking Catholic. You're getting another solo experience with just Mike Walsh today. Giving uh, Actually, I'm not giving anybody time off. We are so overloaded with work as we are preparing for the new school year and the massive welcome for our, no, our new uh, co-juter bishop, uh, Bishop Joseph Williams, who that'll be on September 10th. You know, we're actually overloaded with work to do. So I am here because Jen and Carrie and Marianella and Mike are literally scattered to the four winds. But there was an episode I wanted to do with uh, with one of our new executive directors that I, I, I thought you'd all be interested in. So we're going to do it anyway, even though it's just me. And it's someone I talk to all the time. So hopefully this will be a very organic conversation. Uh, but before I talk about that, if you didn't get the opportunity to see any of the Catholic Star Herald's coverage of this past week's uh, Wedding of the Sea events down at the Jersey Shore, I certainly hope you will. We had uh, quite a bit of coverage in the regular media, secular media, from uh, the Atlantic City Wedding of the Sea with Bishop Dennis Sullivan, uh, which uh, if you're not familiar with it. You always have the mass of the assumption. This year it was in the Hard Rock Hotel in right on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, which I know a lot of people say, why are you having this in a casino hotel? Uh, well, you know what? They reached out to us, and you know this is a great location, and we do a lot of work within the city of Atlantic City. And actually, they couldn't have been kinder. They, they set up the space beautifully. You wouldn't necessarily necessarily think that you were in a church, but you they did you know sort of remove all of that noise you would expect to see at a casino or, a, or someplace where musicians have played. It was very much focused on um, Christ and the Eucharist and Mary, and it was a great event. There were about two thousand people there. This is an event that used to have ten thousand people to it, and you know as with all things over the generations, it goes up and down, but it's back on the upswing now, particularly coming out of COVID. So it was their largest event, and I think in four years, and they're hoping to, you know, increase it every single year. They had a great after party at the uh, Hard Rock Buffet afterwards. That was great. Had a really nice time. And uh, you know, if you if you're not familiar with it, we have the Mass of the Assumption, and then uh, there's a procession from, in this case, from the Hard Rock Casino to the beach, and then Bishop Sullivan gets into a lifeguard boat. And he recreates the blessing of the sea, this old Italian tradition that uh, came over hundreds of years ago with Italian immigrants, where he goes out into the ocean, throws out a ring of flowers, blesses the ocean and its union to the city, and uh, how it is a, uh, a very much a symbiotic relationship, and that God will bless that symbiotic relationship uh, going forward. And it's a beautiful event. Uh, one of the Atlantic City uh, councilmen went out in the boat with... Uh, with Bishop Sullivan, Jesse Kurtz, and uh, he had a blast. He was smiling from ear to ear the entire time, and it's a throng of people, and it's just it's just beautiful to see our Catholic faith in the midst of, you know, people up on the boardwalk and people sunning themselves at the beach or going into the ocean. You know, there were, this year I will say the the crux of humanity around the boat, the lifeguard boat that the uh, bishop was going to be in as it went into uh, as it went into the Atlantic Ocean was really something. That's the first time I've actually been jostled around because the people who were there wanted photos of, you know, bishop getting in the boat, bishop going out, uh, Councilman Kurtz being in there. And just, it, it was really, it was very lively. You know, it's, you know, sometimes our events in the Catholic Church are a little staid, this one was just so incredibly energetic and so incredibly joyful, and it was beautiful weather that day. It was just a great event. So there'll be full coverage in the Catholic Star Herald newspaper that's coming out later this week, or by the time you're listening to this, will have already come out. But it was a, it was a fun time, and I actually have to give a special uh, thank you to our friends at American Magazine. They caught wind of the event and uh, sent one of their executive editors down to take a look at it. So Ashley McKinless wrote this lovely first-person account of her first-ever Wedding of the Sea visit, and she really did a wonderful job of, you know, getting into the uniqueness of the event, and she talked to 
a couple of the Italian grandmothers who are always there and having a great time. She talked to Bishop Sullivan for, for a little while. She talked to uh, some of the CFR sisters who were there. Um, and uh, I think she was truly impressed with it. You know, when I saw her later in the day, um, she had her sandals, she had her shoes off and she was walking up the beach and she had this gigantic smile on her face and she said she really had a good time. So check out uh, America Magazine. Uh, their online uh, website is up there now. You can check out the, that article. They did a really nice job. And you may see one or two stellar photographs in the in that article by uh, yours truly, along with John Kalitz. <clears throat> so, um, you know, just go for the art, go for the story, but have a good time. Anyway, it's a great event. If you haven't been to it uh, ever, which I hadn't, I hadn't heard about it until I came to work for the diocese nine years ago, you know, it's a truly wonderful, fun summertime activity, always on the Feast of the Assumption. It's a, it's a lot of fun to be there. Um, the Mass is delightful. It's always beautiful. All the Masses are beautiful. You can go to the one in Lake City. You can go to the one in Wildwood. That's where uh, the bishops go to. Or, you know, Cape May has it. Seattle City has a great one. Ocean City has a great one. Avalon and Stone Harbor have a great one. So it's, uh, it's worth... It's worth, you know, in this case, it was a Thursday, I think next week or next year. I can't remember when leap year is, but leap year is not going to be next year. So it'll be on a Friday next year. Head down and make it a long, uh, long weekend down the shore and check out then start it by enjoying the Feast of the Assumption. Anyway, that's what uh, we did last week, and it was a lot of fun, but we are very much in prep mode now. But we want to take a minute out to introduce some of you to one of our newest members of uh, leadership here in the Diocese of Camden. She's actually someone you've heard from before. She's been on the podcast before, though I don't remember she's been on the podcast in the vault like we are now. I know she was on via Zoom, but I don't recall if she actually got to sit across from me once and do this, but... um, One of my newest colleagues, well, actually, she's been a colleague for a long time, but she's now the executive director of Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services, Nicole Kiefer, and uh, she decided to give us about 47 minutes of her time right now. (laughs) So, Nicole, how you doing? I'm well, thanks, Mike. How are you? Uh, Good. Thank you very much. The uh, you have had the job now for what two months? Um, not quite two months. Yes, not quite two months. But you have been a member of Vitality for quite some time. I have. I worked briefly for Vitality in 2017 for about six months as a care coordinator, and then I ret- I left for a um, remote position, and returned at the end of 2018 as the director of parish nursing, and have been here since. Well, it is you have. I've talked on the podcast many times that uh, we tend to share space with, on our floor, we share mm-hmm. space with the tribunal and with mm-hmm. Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services mm-hmm. that I will, f- from going forward, only refer to as Vitality. Mm-hmm. And um, I get to see all the Vitality folks all the time, uh, though I didn't get to see you much because during your tenure here, you were oftentimes out and about. Yes. Uh, yes. Vitality folks do not spend a lot of time in the office. Yeah, no. I mean, the, the the point of our ministry is to be like the healing hands of Christ and like a presence in the community that helps to connect people with services and use the different ministries under our organizational umbrella to expand that presence. So, you know, yes, we're in the office, but the heart of our work is in the community, meeting people and helping people during difficult times or just connecting with things. So yes, we are. And true, I was not in the office very much in Camden. I was working every day. Just um, I also worked as a wellness nurse for our diocesan housing for the past three years. So yes, it's uh, yes. I am grateful to be in one location primarily <laughs> right now, though, Mike. It's it is a commute, um, and I also appreciate your plug for the Jersey Shore a few mm. minutes ago as a uh, Cape May County. Uh, resident currently I, I appreciate it um but yeah it's it's it, it's interesting driving it's nice for decompressing and for prepping for the day so yes but and, i am here well as you are on a podcast right now i also recommend it for podcast listening i get all my podcast listening in as i, I trek down to the shore <clears throat> Yeah, I completely wholeheartedly agree. My uh, my three kids would also agree. That mm. was one of the first things. They're like, Mom, you got to get a bunch of podcasts. One. Like, <laughs> you have to have a serious one. You mm-hmm. have to have a lighthearted one. You have to have one to listen to when 
you know, the day's just been a little bit challenging and you need something for your mind to go to. So I'm working on it, but I'm also taking suggestions. So feel free to offer some suggestions. Nothing too deep because, you know, after work, sometimes you need I, a little bit of I assure rest. you. I listen to, uh, as has been discussed on this podcast many times, I listen to a litany of them and none of them uh, are heavy. They're actually okay. mine are mostly comedy uh, focused. Oh, okay. Well, but but I'll, I'll send you a whole list. You, I, that'd be know, great. An entire playlist of them. <laughs> the um, the But, you know, before we get too far, you know, we talked a little bit about what Vitality does, but what does Vitality do? It's it's got a lot of tentacles. It does have a lot of tentacles. Um, the the best way I can say is that we try to be a healthcare presence that is a reflection of our Catholic values in the diocese of Camden. We cover all six counties in the diocese, and what we do is we try to connect people with services, and in that, and what that looks like is. Primarily, it means we help people who don't know where to go when they need help with navigating healthcare circumstances. Mm -hmm. So what can that look like? That can look like someone who is having a hard time paying for their prescriptions and they need help um, looking to see if they can get their prescriptions a little bit cheaper. In that instance, we are able to, you know, talk to the person, have a conversation, and then see if there are other agencies and things like that that might be able to lower their um, prescription costs. And so oftentimes when one, when a person qualifies for one program, they qualify for a lot of others. So what we do at Vitality is we help assess. So we have nurses and social workers that work in our care coordination department, and they help assess what the person's needs are and what will be the best program. And then they don't just stop there with identifying the resource. They help to then do the paperwork, do any of the, you know, navigating conversations and things like that. Um, so for our care coordination team, the primary focus there is to help connect people with services because it can be anything as simple as filling out a form to something as complex as helping them find a home health aid and things like that. Um, we have multiple different ministries. One of our other ministries is our senior ministry. So we have our Life to the Fullest membership um, program. And in that program, um, we try to disseminate health information or any information for older adults that pertains to our diocese to out to them. We have a newsletter that goes out quarterly. Um, we have events. We actually have an event coming up um, on September 29th, a centenarian, a non-genarian event. Hopefully I said that all correctly. You did. Both of them kind of nailed, um, them. nailed them. Both. So, so we have that event coming up, and it's a wonderful event just to honor the people that have been blessed to have such a wonderful life of longevity. Um, for anyone who didn't know what that was, that's <clears throat> people in their 90s and oh, yes. in their hundreds. Yes, it is. Yes, which, which that population is actually really, really um, expanding. We also have our senior day centers, which is a wonderful way for um, older adult population to be able to get out and go have share a meal, share stories, have an activity. Some have physical um, fitness classes and, and just kind of have community and to help with that whole isolation um, problem that we all are hearing so much about in the community. Our hospital chaplaincy program also falls underneath the vitality and under that what we've been able to do is in the past few years, we have been able to make sure that there is a hospital chaplain in every single hospital in South Jersey. And so that's been a phenomenal because it's just kind of aligned. We, we always had chaplains, right? I mean, they were always there. It was just, you know, we centralized that process. So um, parish nursing for um, anyone, you know, unfamiliar parish nurses help with education, advocacy, again, just being a healthcare presence. We put together health fairs, community um, outreach programs, uh, educational programs, Stephen Ministry is also underneath of that, and that is our healthcare, not, excuse me, our mental health kind of presence. They are not counselors. They are individuals that have been trained at length and walk with people during difficult times, which can look different for all of us, right? We're not all the same people. Mm -hmm. And then we also have our um, persons with deaf uh, uh, ministry for deaf and disabled. And so that ministry is, is, is a blessing in our diocese. And in that we have, um, you know, wonderful community that is able to help people who are, you know, who are either part of the deaf community or disabled. And we have masses of inclusion to help for, you know, have a mass that's a little more sensitive and be aware of people that, you know, 
going to a traditional quote unquote Sunday mass might be a little bit much. We try to help parishes integrate these masses so that they can then offer them to their parish community for families that may have someone on the autism spectrum. Um, I think I got everything. I think you did. I think I did. So if you can find like one or two words to kind of encompass that, Mike, let me know. Listen, I've been doing marketing communications uh, with Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services for a long time. And mm-hmm. there's no easy way to sum up everything that you do because it is such a broad uh, ministry yes. that, that touches on so many things, which is why you have a, a robust staff there. I mean, you have a mm-hmm. lot of people who work with you, both uh, employed and volunteers. Mm-hmm. Incredibly helpful. Um, it, it's for me, you know, as, a, as the associate publisher of the newspaper, you are a target rich area. Mm-hmm. There are so many great news stories that come out. The senior ministry every year does, <laughs> they do this prom. Christine Willard, God bless her. Mm-hmm. Um, and even and her predecessor as well, Karen Fisher, who put together these these senior prom activities. They are so much fun to be at. Mm-hmm. Um, our previously mentioned John Kalitz has been has gone out and photographed a couple of them, and he is as jaded as me, and he comes back joyous, joyously because it's just so much fun to see, you know, the, the seniors in our midst who are getting an opportunity to to get out there. And this is actually a good conversation to have right now. As you know, the the nights are starting to get longer. You know, we're on the tail end of summer, and it's going to start getting cold soon. And something we remind people of every year is to really look in on their seniors. You know, once fall and winter hit, and they become far more isolated. You know, programs like that are incredibly important yeah. just for them to get out and and to be around other people. Ideally, people that, with shared experiences. That really does mm-hmm. make a big difference, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We currently have four. Um, in our diocese, three are over in the Echo Berlin area, um, and then another one is over in the Mantua section. And my hope and is to work with Christine to help build those um, the, the the day centers as well as our senior ministry. Because the other the other component of senior ministry they are their parish based programs, and we just help to support and we help to support all of them. But you know just bringing resources in and connecting them with speakers and things like that. But yes, you're right. And I'd say we probably have about another four to six weeks before we start seeing like that, 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 that earlier, um, you know, daylight ending a little bit sooner. And then, um, but the the nice part of these ministries is that most of them meet in the morning right after Mm -hmm. Sunday, excuse me, weekly mass or something along those lines, or they have a very set. It's interesting. I've actually been to, so I'm, you know, doing the tours now and, and, and going to all the hospitals and getting to know all the different hospital chaplains. Um, and then also doing senior day centers as well. And it's interesting, some of them, I think, might hop from parish to parish just to get, <laughs> just to get it. But again, it's that, it's, it's that isolation and it's, it's such a, I mean, you know, it, it, I feel, I feel like if I had come on a podcast here um, a few years ago and said, you know, isolation is a problem, yeah. I probably, you, you would have believed me. However, now you turn on any news station and it is, it, it is so thrown in your face aware it, it, it's blatantly obvious and you know it, it's one of the post pandemic issues that has come out that I'm grateful there's been awareness mm-hmm. truthfully because as you said people kind of go in in the summer you see people and you know everybody's out and about and you know it, it's the summer right that that it's a very social time but there's other parts to the fall and the winter that come out that are just different and you know because not only does it get dark but we also have people who don't have as much access or don't have as many family and so then we have the holidays come up so it's 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 very yeah. it's very cyclical but yes it's 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 definitely an area that um I'm grateful that we identified a problem and we're doing something mm-hmm. you know we can all identify a lot of problems but if we don't start ma- taking action on them that's where we kind of get a little bit stuck so and that's actually something that you know uh, I know when when you were hired you know that was that mm-hmm. actual conversation you you're taking over for Deacon Jerry J- Joplinowski who did a fantastic mm-hmm. job of creating vitality he came on board in 2015 when uh, the diocese had a number of nursing homes that um, we, the diocese ultimately ended up selling because, it, as Bishop Sullivan said, we're not in the nursing home business. We're mm-hmm. in the care business. So those were sold off to, a, to another entity. But we wanted to remain in the, in the healthcare field, mm-hmm. in the healthcare uh, world. 
So we asked Deacon Jerry to come on and come up with a with a plan for how could we as a diocese still, you know, minister to people in need from a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. And Deacon Jerry did a great job of creating this Vitality uh, Catholic Healthcare Service, which is is now so broad. But even then, it's, we feel like we've only scratched the surface, right? Yeah. There is so much more need out there. Now you're very new to this rule, two two months in. Mm -hmm. I can't. I, I would. It would. I would be foolish of me to think that you have concrete plans for areas of expansion. But do you have ideas for how you'd like to expand Vitality going forward? I do. I do. So I I agree. Um, we uh, Vitality has a phenomenally strong foundation. And for anyone who has worked with me with parish nursing or wellness nursing or anything, I there, I have a couple fundamental truths. And one is that communication is key. Mm. And the other is that if you don't build a strong foundation, no matter what you do build, it will not succeed. Yeah. And so, um, you know, at this point, yes, I am trying to get familiar with the areas that I didn't have visibility to because it just wasn't, you know, I, I, wasn't my lane, for lack of a better way of saying it. <laughs> so yes, I am uh, quickly getting up to speed on that. Um, I would say that most of my vision is a reflection of what we currently do. So with what I mean by that is building the presence. I, I think we could put a lot of different terms on it, but the word that I like that I think encompasses what Vitality does is we build a presence, build a presence to help people realize what we can do to help them. I mean, we have really, and I know I've spoken on this podcast before about this, we have had people that go to our day center that have been able to come off of meds, early diagnoses of dementia and forgetfulness and things like that. The power that has yeah. is, is, is something. So I definitely, I would like to see our senior day centers be expanded. That, that that's one of my biggest biggest goals is to is to expand the the presence. We have five deaneries, mm -hmm. and we currently have most of our senior day centers in one one maybe two of the deaneries. Um, so parish pastors are going to be hearing from me. I've already uh, put some little little feelers out there. Well, the, the 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 blessing is that I've had the privilege to go around to our diocese for the past six years. Mm -hmm. I can give a short list very quickly of who has ADA accessible bathrooms, who has the kitchen, who has a strong parish nurse ministry that may have some people who could help volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I think the value in that is, is, is just phenomenal because we're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. You know, that Deacon Jerry and Mimi Scheibel and all the other founders of this ministry, you know, they did that for us and, and they laid that for us and they helped see what works and what doesn't doesn't work. So I don't need to reinvent things. I need to help expand the presence so that um, I think when I, while I was interviewing, somebody said to me that they wanted to make sure that everyone knew about vitality. And I was grateful to hear that because that's what I want. I yeah. just want to make sure that we do that. Some other ideas, um, I would really like to see a continuation of our stinger, singer, excuse me, Stephen's ministry. Mm -hmm. um, I actually know of some parishes that are currently going through training and some that just finished. Mental health is a huge crisis right now. And anybody that we can get out there that is trained on how to listen and sit with people in those murky times when people don't know how to talk to each other and don't know who to talk to period I just think that that it that is crucial our ministry for deaf and disabled um, I think that we could definitely build a little bit more presence there um, I know that father Bradley who oversees that and the people and the volunteers and our interpreters do a phenomenal job I also have gotten wind that we are um, building our inclusion mass schedule up a little bit mm -hmm. so I would really like to see where you know a, a, a dream would be that there is at least one parish having a mass every Sunday of inclusion you know I, we, I don't think we've talked much on this podcast about what inclusion masses are. Could you, you describe what an inclusion mass is? I will. I will do my best, Mike, because I'll be honest, learn a lot of new things here. But basically, <laughs> inclusion masses are masses that um, have less, you know, they, they, they're, they're less stimulating. That's the, probably mm. the easiest way I can say it. People, um, individuals of any, of any age who are on the autism spectrum disorder, stimulation is very important and it's it's very important to watch the tone of your voice to watch the lighting to watch music to watch length um that there's a lot of key ingredients here and research has shown that if you give a population that already has these uh 
precursors and things like that, this predisposition to be an overstimulated. If you monitor and really pay attention to to what the, the, the situation is and you're really, really just mindfulness of it, you can have phenomenal outcomes. Um, so what the mass is, is you still have all your traditional, you know, Catholic uh, requirements and things like that. But the homily, you know, the priest might be asked to speak for maybe a minute or two versus five or six or seven minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and the music, we may have a little bit of low music accompanying it. But traditionally, there's not much music. Mm -hmm. um, and also lighting. So um, for, for many individuals who are on the autism spectrum disorder, seizures is a huge, huge thing that we need to be mindful of. So lighting, for those of you who don't know, lighting can actually trigger migraines, seizures, ocular moments, and things like that. So the goal of it is to kind of bring everything down a little bit so that you go into this space of calm, quiet, you try to control as many of the external environmental factors mm -hmm. as you can. What the result is, is that the masses are typically shorter. So and quite a few people like that part too. It's a benefit. <laughs> and, and here's the thing is that, um, you know, so we've actually been doing this in the diocese for quite some time. We have. Um, but this, is, this has become something that's a, uh, somewhat well known in those areas, but mm -hmm. if you go to an Eagles game, they now have rooms specifically set aside for mm -hmm. uh, people who who need this kind of you know comfort level Correct. to be able to enjoy the experience. Yeah. Disney's been doing it for decades. You know mm -hmm. there are you know and and actually Disney was at the forefront, and I know this because. I happen to be friends with a couple of Imagineers from Disney. Um, when they're they are. You know, uh, a lot of scientists in the autism field have reached out to Disney because they have found out that a lot of people, when they go, a lot of people who are on the spectrum, when they go to Disney, they have completely different reactions to things, positive reactions to mm -hmm. things in the Disney space that no one else does because, you know, those on the spectrum see the world differently. Mm -hmm. And being, and, and Disney has actually been able to alter some of their projects to be more accommodating mm -hmm. for people on the spectrum. And, and for those of us who are not on the spectrum, at least, knowingly anyway um you know we might not think about it but you know for those in the community it is a real struggle i i have mm -hmm. autism in my family and you know we we've changed things to accommodate and it's it's made a world of difference mm -hmm. making those the folks who are who you know or you know are on this on the spectrum make them feel like they're part of the community which let's face it in the catholic faith that's exactly what we're we're here for. We want to right. bring people into faith. We don't want to make people feel, you know, that it's this this event that we're having, this mass, this anything is is so traumatic for them that they can't become a part of it. That we can make we can make allotments for that and make mm -hmm. it make it so that people will be willing to come. I love the fact that we do that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you're right. It, the more we're integrating this, it's it, it it's just phenomenal, and particularly because. For many, mass is a familial. You know, you go with you go with your spouse, you go with your family, you go with your children, and unfortunately, if you have people who are sensitive to the light or the music or whatever those components are, that breaks it up. You know, and, and so you know, we we want to. Um, what is the, what did our new coadjutor bishop say? Uh, coadjutor Bishop Williams say, cultivate a culture of encounter I think yeah. was something he had said and I think that just really is we we want we want to meet people and we want to include people so that they know that we we do welcome them and we do want to be there for them because you know we have the masses of inclusion however you know there's inclusion of so many different things the word quote unquote normal is not um you know the most posh to say because the truth is normal is a relative term That's and, right. and we need to make sure that we are including many different people Mm -hmm. is, is really how we need to look at it. But yes, you know, being able to celebrate and go to things as a family or even with friends, you know, that it's still, you, you, you want to, you want a community. Yeah. Community is what, um, I think I just heard a study last week. I believe it was something coming out of the blue zones probably. And it said that, um, actually it was a Harvard study. There's a Harvard study that's been going on since the 1930s on, um, successful living. There's mm -hmm. a way fancier title for that than I can give you, Mike. <laughs> but the bottom line is community is one of the main components of longevity in life. So the more that we do as a Catholic community to include all people, 
I think the better we're gonna we're gonna have. So so my goal is to hopefully get um, these inclusion masses, and I know that um, others before me have been working on building this um, because this also is a population you have to be a little more mindful with with illness and things like that. So you know th it's multifactorial, right? Mm -hmm. Just like many things are, but. Yes, hopefully we can do that. And then the other thing that I'm hoping to accomplish is to work a little bit on isolation with reaching out to people who, who might not always come forward. So we have a Life to the Fullest membership program um, that we send newsletters and we keep we keep in contact with. And one way to do that is to just make calls and check in and yeah. do and see how the people are doing. So again, long-term goals. For now, I'm just trying to, you know, get familiar with everything, learn everything and just, you know, Keep my head afloat some days, Mike. I... <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. Yes. The, um, you know, well, that's, and that's actually made me, you know, it's a, a wonderful indictment of vitality is that even though you've been a part of it for so many years, you yourself were not mm -hmm. completely certain of what every program that was, Correct. because it is so broad and mm -hmm. there is so much to do. So um, I hope that people who may not know much about vitality will check it out. I'll tell you this, that they have a 24 seven care coordinator line it i mean it's open 24 7 mm -hmm. it's staffed and people will respond or within like normal business hours mm -hmm. um and then if you leave a message you should get a call back within a day or two yeah. one or two business days you can call 24 hours but unfortunately we're not going to be here at 2 or 3 a.m <laughs> to answer it but we're happy to call as soon as the office opens again <laughs> the but it but it's been very useful i know a number of people have used it over the years and it's this is not something that's restricted to catholics right uh, anybody no. Catches oh no wind that's of the, it? see that's the beauty that's what see uh, you know when people when i'm asked in the community how do i describe vitality i say that we fulfill a niche in the community that cannot be replicated and the beauty and the reason i say that is because all of our services are free Mm -hmm. um, there are other organizations who do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but everything we do is completely free. And you also don't need to be Catholic. You need to live within the confinements of the diocese of Camden. So anywhere up from Camden all the way down to Cape May. Um, but, but I'll be honest, we've been known to help outside of the diocese too. It's not, we, 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 we don't really send or turn people away, but yes, anyone can access us. Um, and you know, we, we're on Facebook, and we're mm -hmm. we're building our presence on Facebook right now. <laughs> but you're um, also you're also inter intra ministerial. I mean, I know you've done are. worked with Catholic charities. You already mm -hmm. talked about how you've worked with the uh, Dallas housing. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a lot of overlap between these specialized services. Yes, there is a lot of synergy between Vitality and many different programs. I think the, the biggest area you see that, so so we in Vitality, we intersect all the time. I mean, you know, so that, that example I gave you of the person who um, needed help for prescription assistance. So it's quite possible that when the care coordinator gets in there, they realize that the person is living alone and actually is having a hard time doing laundry or maybe is having a hard time getting to mass. So they may call on one of our smaller ministries, a mercy team member to help and see if there's one locally to help with um, bringing somebody in uh, excuse me, some, someone to mass. Um, and then they also, as they're talking to them, may also recognize that the person just seems a little bit lonely and, and you know, could is going through a challenging time and can then ask if maybe do you, would you like to talk to a Stephen minister? So then, you know, they would go bring that in. And then sometimes the person, um, you know, while parish nurses cannot do hands-on nursing care, it's beyond our ANA scope of practice, we can be a presence that re reassures people so sometimes you may it may be you know as the care coordinator who is also a registered nurse but in the capacity a little bit differently there the parish nurse you know the care coordinator may say you know is there any chance that one of the parish nurses can go in and just help mr smith understand why he's taking these medications i always say in parish nursing i can i can't give you your medication i can't fill your pill box but i can explain to you why you're taking it and i can let you know when we need to call the doctor to say mm -hmm. listen this isn't working or etc so there's a lot of that and then we do frequently piggyback not piggyback but like work hand in hand with catholic charities and you know we we might have somebody who needs a little bit of help just with paying bills for a certain period of time so catholic charities through their grants and different things like that obviously we look at the requirements and if it's suitable match and things like that we'll do that but we also work closely with them sometimes when we get immigrant referrals and things like that mm -hmm. um just documentations and connecting them with medicaid and you know just just navigating those channels right i mean in, in every industry right now the channels are so difficult to navigate so really our our goal with with vitality is to help navigate those channels and help you know i i think what a you know um 
I am not one of those people that has a guy for that. But I always <laughs> say the people have a guy for that. That that that's one of the things is you need to be willing to find a guy. Mm-hmm. And I think if anyone knows me out there in the community, they know that if they come to me, although this is probably one of my worst traits, <laughs> I'm probably <laughs> going to find I'm going to do everything I can to try and help them. And I think that's just my fundamental the way that I am. Well, it's that is an excellent transition. Because I wanted the the first half of the conversation to be all about vitality, and Uh we are now in the second half of the the conversation. We're going to talk all about you. Oh, wow. So uh, what takes a young woman from South Jersey, a Paul VI high school graduate, what brings her into the world of nursing? Um, Wow. You've been a registered nurse for how long? So I've been a registered nurse for 25 years. Um, I will be transparent. I went into nursing because I actually was told by a wise person that it was a good fundamental step to do for another career I really wanted to pursue. Mm. And that I kind of was told that if you get your RN, you can pretty much do all these other healthcare components. So that's really how I got to be in in nursing. Um, Unbeknownst to me, uh, life, God, the universe (laughs) had a very different plan. It's funny how that works. Yeah, it's a little bit scary too, Mike. But um, yes, so I... Wait, wait, you mean 25 years ago you didn't see yourself as executive director of this thing called Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services? No, a year ago, maybe six months ago. (laughs) We've had many conversations. Three months ago, I wouldn't have seen it. Um, So that's a different podcast. We can do that as follow-up if you want. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll be your next one. But um, nursing. So I like helping people. Mm -hmm. It's very intrinsic to me. I think you yourself have said I I, I care and I, I, I enjoy being there to help people. Um, I more just don't want people to feel lost, I think is really what it is. I, I, I really have a need for people to realize their value. Yeah. Um, and I also have realized that God gave me a voice, which many people probably don't always love, but I, 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 I find a hard time keeping quiet unnecessarily. And so nursing was something that came, I'm from a long lineage of nurses. My mom's a nurse, my aunt's a nurse, very large family, my husband's a nurse. Of uh, everybody's nurses, and so I knew that when this when this person told me you should um, you should get your RN first, I knew at the time that I, I could get an RN in two years, and then I could quickly go on to what I really wanted to quote unquote be. Unbeknownst to me, one of my clinicals was at Cooper in Camden, and um, that really was a pivotal turning point for for my nursing career. In that, one of the nurses on the floor. Um, introduced me to an externship program. I believe they have a similar, but not exactly. I think it's, it's titled differently, but the bottom line is when you're between your junior and senior year of nursing, you can go in and work in a hospital. And you you basically work as like a patient care tech or whatever term it, that hospital has, but the nurses on the floor know. So you you stay within your scope of practice. You don't you stay everything you do, but they teach you a little bit more. And so I was blessed to get into that program, and then I stayed on for my last year and floated. And um, on Holy Saturday, I got a phone call in the morning that they needed a, um, a an extern to go to the neonatal ICU. At Cooper and Camden that night, and I very quickly, and you know me, I'm very honest, and I said, oh, I think you called the wrong person. <laughs> and they said, no, 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 this is the supervisor. I called the right person. You're be in here at 7. You're going to do fine. And so I went, and I mean, I've always loved babies, so that wasn't the problem, but these babies are like, you know, yeah. the size of your hand. So everything, I answered phones, I held babies, I did everything within the scope, and quickly became a graduate nurse there. And when I graduated nursing school and passed my boards, I was offered a full-time NICU position uh, in Camden. And to be honest, I kind of thought that was where I was going to stay forever. Mm. I really liked it that much. And then life interceded and things changed and it's just not where I was meant to be. And so I left it for a while, but I did go back. And and ultimately I, I left it again because there was a draw I couldn't put a finger on. And I just knew that I'm I'm a firm advocate that people actually know when they're not supposed to be somewhere or in a relationship mm-hmm. or in a job. Mm-hmm. It's just sometimes we don't listen to that little voice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit kind of has to smack you on the head a little bit. Well, I have to say that the, you apparently listen to the Holy Spirit, much like myself, because you are the only person that I've... I'm actually looking through your resume right now, which I, now has to be classified as fully as a CV. Cause this, yes. is, this is a curriculum vitae. We need you to write more. 
but uh, but that's that's the only flaw I can see in your uh, in your CV here mm-hmm. because you have had as many jobs as me and I've been all over the place. <laughs> the um, and I got to say, one of them included a trip to Hawaii. But you were in San Diego for a little while and then in Hawaii as well. I I was, but I was geographically not in those places. So when I worked in Hawaii, I was I, in, in Hawaii. I worked as a school nurse for a while. Uh, my husband and I moved our three children to Hawaii for a few years. Definitely a different podcast episode <laughs> and in that in that in that sector um the island we lived on did not have a neonatal icu oh, yeah. and so the i island took, where you on we were on the big island okay. where the volcano is erupting mm-hmm. the, the biggest geographical island also known as um hawaii mm-hmm. but it, it's called the big island and so we lived there and so my husband was er er's nurses there's always an er not always a neonatal icu and hawaii actually only has at the time this is like 15 years ago they had one nick it was on oahu mm. <clears throat> And so not a very good source of income for me. So I went to work at a private school. Fascinating, fascinating experience. So yes, I did work there. The California-based companies, I actually worked 100% remote. So I worked remotely from New Jersey for two California-based companies. One was a chronic disease company, which truly changed the trajectory of my career. When I left um, NICU in 2014, um, I really just... I left. I took like a quick job that was just to hold me over. And um, a recruiter reached out to me and asked me to switch to chronic disease. I too asked her if she was crazy. <laughs> um, and I said, I think I think you have the wrong resume. I said, I, I'm, I'm peds. I've been peds for over 10 years. And she said, no, you have some really big, strong skill sets. And so um, I, I fought my way into that role after learning more about it and switched from beginning of life to end of life. And utilized every resource um, I could to learn and get on board as quickly as I could and ultimately love that job. Mm. And I actually, over the past few months, have seen where that job is so similar to the job I do now. Um, unfortunately, CMS coach changed and they got rid of registered nurses and I lost that role. And then the other San Diego-based company I worked for, both were startups, um, was a startup for a dermatologic phototherapy device, which is a phenomenal device and Mm -hmm. helps people really, really, um, in the community. I was the last clinician standing and I was exhausted. And (laughs) so that's when I jumped that. So, um, and it's interesting. So the reason my resume reads like a CV is that you'll see that when I left neonatal ICU in 2004, I moved to work in academia. Um, I worked, I um, ran pediatric clinical trials for Temple Children um, University Medical Center. And in that role, CV is the, is yeah. the way to go. You, know, yeah. you, don't, you don't have that. So you have to list everything, every, all the investigator initiated, all that stuff. So that is why it reads more of a CV. Plus, I've definitely had your non-traditional nursing career. That so. is very true. I, I'm, I'm blessed to know a lot of nurses and none of their resumes look like this. The uh, uh, no, the ones unlikely. I know, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, no, actually, I, I'm serious about that. You know, they, like you said before, there's a, there's a natural tendency to towards homeostasis, and mm-hmm. you know everything stays the way it is. And right. you might move around inside a building or something like that, but it's rare to jump and jump and jump, uh, particularly for such large jumps like that. Uh, but for someone like me, you know, sometimes something people might see that as a negative. I see that as an incredible positive. I love talking to people who've had a bunch of different jobs, ideally leaving for all the right reasons as opposed to leaving for all the wrong reasons, because that happens occasionally. I've been, mm-hmm. it's, you know, I've, I've admitted to it. I was asked to leave once or twice from a couple of jobs, and that, yeah. that happens. That's fine. I was right, it but it's okay. Um, but, but you're now, particularly now that you're, you know, the executive director for for a, you know an initiative, a ministry that's so broad. Mm-hmm. I have to imagine having this kind of broad background mm-hmm. is helpful in that regard. Yes, absolutely, positively. the The skill set that I've acquired it, it, through the transition of my career is I, I don't think I could put a dollar sign on it. Is the truth? I know how to. I know how to do things and I know how to ask the right questions. And I think that's one of the things that I've really, really honed in on in the past few years. And and again, advantageous to have worked in startups, you know, your jack of all trades, master of none. And and, and to be quite fair, Vitality is a startup fundamentally. I mean, that's what we did was that Bishop Sullivan saw a need, wanted to continue a presence, hired the right person and Deacon Jerry to to initiate this. and, and, And we went from there. And so having my startup background really has been helpful. And yes, I've seen where I know how to, it helps you with 
um, navigating conversations is the truth. I think the, the biggest example I can give is, um, you know, healthcare technology is a huge booming mm. industry. And I can remember sitting, so I've been working with startups. There's a lot of portal development and patient development. So I've worked at a lot of different building portals and things like that. But I remember sitting with a software engineer for one of the companies and he just dialed it down so simply. Now, what I wanted from him, he said, you're not getting that. And Mike knows me a little bit. And for those <laughs> out there in the world that know me, I can accept I, no, I can. I just need to understand. When did that happen? I, I, if I understand, <laughs> yes. how come? It's not that I'm oh. saying no, 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 no. I'm saying help me understand. And I remember his name was Greg. And, and Greg said, that's not happening. But he and I had, had a, a good, we had a good uh, rapport personality wise. And I, I said, Greg, you're killing me. Like, I need this. And he said, What is your goal? What do you want? If I did this for you, what do you need to see? And so I explained to him whatever it was I needed. It had to do with skin colors or whatever. And he said, Oh, well, what if I did this, this, and this? And I use that example all the mm -hmm. time because I think, you know what? That's it. What's the goal? Mm -hmm. What's the goal? You know, yeah, I can't do this for you but I can do this for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm frequently, people will hear me saying, unfortunately that is not in my scope or that is not something we're able to do. However, I can do this, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I think that my personality um, also kind of helps with building my skill set. I love talking to people. And I also think that when you go in to help someone, you find an hour later that they actually didn't really need help with that. Sometimes they just needed you to sit and listen and, and and I think that's that that's an area that I have been afforded the opportunity through this non traditional nursing career to see the hospital administrators, the, the the administrators in other realms, to work with community people, to work with the older adult population. I mean, what a blessing to have been embedded in housing for a few mm. years and really see the day to day. Um, what a blessing that I have people with disabilities in my own families and I'm able to see that while I would love to take away those challenges for them, God has a reason for us. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I have absolutely, I will fully disclose, I have had um, interviews in my career where someone will say, okay, explain to me why you're jumping around so much. Mm -hmm. if, if I sit and tell you my story, my, my background makes perfect sense. It was really navigating where I was at the time, and I will never take a role that is not good for me professionally or for my family. Yeah. And so in some instances, that was really it. But in every single role that I've ever had, I've learned something and I've continued to build on it. And some of them were lessons that God said, you need this because I need you to do something else and we need to beat this into your head now yeah. so that you understand. <laughs> so, so yes, it's, it, it, it's been, it, it's, I can't tell you how, um, invaluable it's been to have this really, really broad skill set that I truthfully until like the past year or so didn't see why I had it. Yeah. It didn't make a whole, a whole lot of sense. All right. So uh, two more personal questions I ask you. Okay. What kind of a lunatic lives at the Jersey Shore year round? Oh, well. And we, by the way, I lived at the Jersey Shore year round for two okay. years. I know why I did it. Why do you do it? I think lunatic is a really strong word, unkind word. Okay, <laughs> um, so I think you might want to soften some of that. Um, but I have to. I li the listeners haven't heard me laugh all episode. I, I needed something. To needed make me a happy. chuckle. Oh, okay. Chuckle. Well, I think we could have, we could have, we could have changed that word. But okay. okay. Um, why do we live at the Jersey Shore? Long and short of it, um, we moved to Hawaii after living in Washington Township. And, okay, say no more. I got it now. And no, my husband refused to do the rat race of 42. <laughs> so um, a compromise for New Jersey was that we live there. So, so yes, yeah, so that is why I do live there. Although sometimes I do wonder why we live there year round. I will tell you that uh, the thing is, is that all of us who don't live there year round are very jealous of you for, for living down there. You have, uh, it's that being said, and matter of fact, you know, I'm connected with either through the diocesan sites or my own personal sites. I'm connected through you to your, your mm -hmm. daughter, who, if anyone hasn't figured it out yet right now, uh, her daughter is Lex Kiefer, who is uh, one of our great YouTube hosts. Uh, she does uh, Changing with the Tides, and it's absolutely delightful. Matter of fact, so much so that uh, 
when our new coadjutor bishop uh, Joe Williams came north, uh, the first what the first thing he said to you, amongst the first things he said to you, was complimenting you on yes. your daughter's show. Uh, yes, he uh, apparently, in research to learn more about our diocese, stumbled upon um, our vicar general father Robert Hughes's YouTube uh, episode that Alexis had um, taped with him. And asked Bishop Sullivan and Father Hughes who that was. <laughs> so, so yes, he 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 was very impressed by her. Yes. Um, by her. I have, I've had the pleasure of meeting. I think I don't know that I know. I don't. I know I've met everybody in your family. Mm-hmm. I think your daughter Maddie might be the only one that I haven't spent any extended time with. Yeah, but. She's... Um, the uh, the your family is amongst uh, the loveliest people I've met. They they seriously, <laughs> you look at me like I'm cross eyed. They are lovely guys. I didn't pay them. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love working with Lex. Lex is one of the most cheerful human beings I've ever met in my entire life. And every time she just comes to the building, she's always so kind. Just come and say hi to me and hang out in our offices and stuff like that. And that's lovely. Your son Zach worked for the newspaper a little mm-hmm. bit, and I uh, wrote a bunch of articles for us, and we really appreciated that. Your husband Matt had God bless him. Uh, you, so you guys are friendly with the Vicar General, and every time we do a major event, the first thing he says is, we're going to need some uh, nurses here just in case somebody goes down. I ah, will have Matt and Nicole do that. So I've, I've had the opportunity to hang out with Matt on a couple of major events mm-hmm. um, where uh, he's he's a delightful sort. Big he big is. fan of your husband. Thanks. Good he's man. a delightful sort. <laughs> he is a delightful sort. I he know. is. The, but I'm not married to him, so it might be a different story. But uh, but uh, he's so great. And you're, so your family's so lovely. And, Thank and, you. And yeah. you know, we love having them part of the greater diocesan family. So that's been nice as well. Thank you. We are blessed to live here and to be able to, you know, share a lot of our family attributes with the world, which I know probably doesn't make sense if you don't know us as a family, but we, you know, uh, with, with Alexis and with uh, Zach is, he did, was here. He's also in the military. We have a lot of different unique circumstances in our family. And so service is important and giving back and recognizing that, you know, we have a lot and we've been very blessed in our life. It's, it's, it's through true divine intervention that we are able to live down the shore. And we're very grateful and blessed to have that happen. And yes, we, um, and Maddie, you may know, I don't know. She's the quieter one. She's, she's well, she's the, the only one that hasn't worked for me yet. So maybe I need to, no. maybe I need to alter that. Perhaps you could call her. All right. Well, Hey, listen, I need say. writers. As a matter of fact, her mother needs to start writing some like white papers and stuff like that for us soon. So okay. Well, when her mother stops dealing with some of <laughs> once I once I plateau and okay. navigate some of the new conversations I've had to have, I would be happy. But it probably will not necessarily be a white paper. But I'm happy to okay. give a little bit of that. I don't know that I'm scholarly enough to say that I can write a white paper. I think a white paper on the senior ministries would absolutely uh, the the um, senior daycare centers. Perhaps. I think that would be fantastic. Perhaps. I could encourage in that. I can make that I'm happen. I'm sure you could. I'm sure we could come up with a list of topics that you would encourage me. So Nicole and I were having a conversation before the podcast where we talked about how um, how much is asked of us, uh, both of us, uh, individually in our roles here. And the, it's very true. And uh, But the problem is, Nicole, that much is asked of, of those who have the abilities. And you and I have unfortunately gotten a reputation yeah. of having abilities. I am inherently a couch, pot- couch potato. I just want to sit around and do nothing all day. Oh my that gosh. very rarely happens, though. So. I am not inherently a couch potato. <laughs> um, so, and those of you who know me, they're working or personally know that I, I I thrive on going and doing and things like that. But I also have a very introverted side um, that people don't no one has usually. Ever seen. People have seen it. It just doesn't come out as much. But yeah. um, and I think it. I, I also think that it's it's been cultivated through experience. Sure. And that it's more of a. I I now it's an awareness, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when we're twenty, we don't really know what it is we need and things like that. And Very true. while all the you know unlovely attributes come of aging, with you know things hang mm. places differently and look a different <laughs> color and all this other stuff. You also, you, you learn what works and what doesn't work and yeah. you, you learn boundaries and you learn what you need and things like that. So I think that's what it is. So, but well, yes, I, I, I would appreciate not being a doer. I think the word here is we, we're no, doers, no. Mike, right? No, no, no. We're yeah. doers. That's why we're here. Yep. Uh, I, and, I, and for anyone who's wondering, I didn't have it figured out until I was 37. So, and I, it's still day to day, whether I actually have it figured out or not. I uh, So in the last minute, I just want to bring something else up. Um, and this comes, I think this has come through in your, in our conversation. You're also a very spiritual person. You know, your spirituality really does, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if it dictates, 
as much as informs or maybe supports mm -hmm. everything that is that you do. But you, mm -hmm. in our conversations we've ever had, you know, one on one after the fact, or in certainly conversations like this, you really do, you know, make a point that your faith mm -hmm. is an important part of your life. It is for sure. I think that. Um, yeah, I, I could give you a whole hour's podcast on why. I'll just say that I have had a lot of different circumstances in life. And there literally have been moments, humbling on your knee moments, that you really, that, that there, there has to be a higher being. And so I, well, because I don't know how else would navigate this situation yeah, and, um, that sometimes is, is, is our world and my life and our lives and things like that. But I really, I've found a lot of healing through just believing in presence. Yeah. And I also have, um, I'm, I'm a huge user of resources. I, I, I just believe so much that, we, you know, it takes a village, even as we're adults. And I've had some great mentors, spiritual mentors, and just physical, professional, personal mentors. And I've learned who to keep close and help me. And physically had some moments that absolutely positively the Holy Spirit could have been the only person and God could have been the only person that sent them because he was the only one that knew that mm -hmm. I had requested that. Yeah. And um, I would say probably in the past year is when that presence has really, um, I put a request out and was very, um, and had nothing to do with the role I'm in now. It was a very shocking response at a very unlikely time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, wow, someone actually is listening never that I thought they didn't but yes I am I, I my moral compass is high and unfortunately mm. I don't do anything that I don't feel is the right thing to do well that's what but I yes. like to hear well thank you Nicole very much for sitting down thank with you. us today if you want to learn more about Vitality Catholic Healthcare Services go to vitality.gamdendiocese.org to learn more thank and you. uh Thanks. Thank you. We'll Thank you, you Mike, for having me. I sure appreciated thing. everyone. Thank you for enduring the torture. And please <laughs> reach out to us. All right. Thank See you. everybody. Talk to you again next week. Bye.